Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome. I'm super excited to have our guest today. It's Dr. Diane Hamilton. We've met recently. We had an awesome conversation just yesterday, and uh, twice in two days, I feel very honored. So welcome, Diane. I feel honored. This was fun. This will be fun because we'll look at it from different perspectives. Yesterday, you were great on my show, by the way. Thank oh, well, thank you. So <laughs> for those who uh, might not have come across Diane before, and I think that's probably a small pocket of people in the world, uh, she's a business behavioral expert, one of the Thinkers 50, and just has such a plethora of uh, curiosity herself, and we'll learn a little bit more about that, and energy, and just this beautiful nature of uh, allowing people to be in flow and uncover really great insights. So I'm excited to see what we can do today. I'd like to just start off with just, in your own words, a little bit of your background and perhaps journey, uh, some of the highlights uh, that, you've, that you've gone through in your career would be really great. Well, you know, I've done a lot of different things. That's one of the good things about getting older. <laughs> you do just about everything by this time. But uh, I started out, I've always kind of been in sales. You know, when I was younger, I was in a lot of sales related kind of uh, industries from everything from pharmaceuticals to computers and software, uh, real estate lending, agricultural chemicals, you name it. I've been in all these different industries. And I, I love being in sales to some extent, but I I got very interested um, later as I started adding more education and in getting into the education realm. Uh, I ended up getting a, a PhD in business management and wrote my doctoral dissertation on emotional intelligence and its impact on sales performance, since that's what I knew. And which is kind of a funny story of how I fell into that. But as, as I fell into it, uh, I started being really interested in personality and assessments and uh, just thought that this is a really an interesting way to quantify some of these things that I had never thought about before. So uh, at, at the same time, I was teaching a lot. I've taught more than a thousand uh, business courses. I, I ran uh, the MBA program as MBA program chair at the Forbes School of Business and did a lot of that kinds of, you know, a lot of things that, uh, with education. And uh, when I left there, I, I just went into starting my own uh, business, which I already was running, but I was doing it kind of part-time and I went more full-time to uh, work on uh, a book about curiosity and to spend more time doing my radio show and doing things like that. And, but I, my main focus is on curiosity right now and perception, actually. I have another book coming out next year on that. But uh, it's all about uh, behavioral issues and how we can help uh, organizations achieve more success. I mean, it's just fascinating. And I'm, you know, I'm in awe of the fact that your radio station, just before we were hitting record, just the um, volume of people that you know, have inspired me in my journey and that you've had the opportunity to have these conversations with them. Um, who is your favorite uh, that you've, or not necessarily favorite, but something that you found maybe surprising or really interesting uh, in your journey of those different interviews? It's just also interesting. You know, it was great having Steve Forbes on. I mean, I worked yeah. you know, at the Forbes School, so I got to know Steve pretty well from that. Of course, he's always amazing. Keith Crock was just an amazing guy too. And he wrote the foreword for my book on curiosity. He was the uh, chairman and um, former CEO of uh, DocuSign and took that public and now he's under secretary in Washington. One of the most connected, interesting guys you'll ever meet. But I've had so many billionaires that, you know, yeah. when you're talking to billionaires, it's, you know, from Craig, Craig Newmark of Craigslist or, you're, uh, you know, you name, uh, we've talked to uh, Naveen Jain, you and I both know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Jeff Hoffman, uh, Priceline, you just go through the list of all the really interesting people. Um, I, I can't say that any one was more interesting than the next. When I get off of this interview, I'll be interviewing Tom Peters, who wrote the most successful business book of all time. You know, I'm sure he'll be right at the yeah. top of the list. And yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't know. Albert Bandura, I want to say, was one of the coolest guys to interview because he, next to Sigmund Freud, I mean, that's one of the names you hear the most in psychology. Yeah. And he's 93, I think, or going on 94. <laughs> 
and he invited me to his house and I got to meet him in person after we interviewed him. <laughs> it, it is amazing. And you know, our, our motivation behind, you know, having conversations, is it to, you know, find an angle? Is it to get a competitive edge or is it about education or is it just because you want to ask questions, you know, in life? And I guess you've got very good at asking questions uh, of that experience. And, um, you know, I, I want to uh, just pick up Naveen Jain because I remember it was a year or two ago I saw him talk and he's talking about his family and his approach, you know, as a, a wealthy individual, had multiple successes, some challenges in his life, mm-hmm. um, but just how he's managed to raise a family of amazing performers as well and instilling this uh what from the outside looks like a culture and behavior that uh just again maybe embodies part of curiosity to solve problems and challenges from very unique ways well you know naveen was interesting i actually picked him up at the airport and showed him around town when he (laughs) and i took we went to dinner with my husband and i took him to dinner that night prior before he had to speak at, at uh, a Genius Network event the next day. And so I had some time to speak with him outside of the show interviewing yep. him. And he just focuses so much on learning. He, yep. you know, everything is learning the next thing. And he doesn't care if he knows anything about an industry, he'll just jump into it and learn everything he can from scratch with fresh eyes which I, I thought was really fascinating. Um, he was uh, working on the, uh, his uh, moon, moon book. exploration, when, yeah. not just Biome, but he had Moon Express, I believe, yep. was his other company. And it was fun because we were having dinner and he kept staring at the moon <laughs> the whole night. And we got a chance to talk about that of how they would mine the moon. And it just everything he does is all about his curiosity about learning something new. And I think he had that culture uh, very much instilled in him from his family. And I'm yep. sure he passes that on to his passes children. I know his son is super successful and I know he does a lot to do, to instill that. And I think, you know, coming to your career where you described and you use the word, you know, you fell into something, you know, <laughs> um, how much of it do you think was because of um, your environment and your upbringing to just being um, someone who looks you know, beyond their toes, looks up in the world, <laughs> takes inspiration and, and looks to go and discover things. What part of that do you think was who you are and maybe part of your family and culture in what shaped that uh, progression for you? You know, it's really an interesting question. And I look at that a lot because when I research curiosity for the book, uh, we, we all have curiosity. There's the curiosity gene as coined by the Max Planck Institute. You know, it, it's... Uh, it's something that you need as an individual, as a human, as a, an animal. I mean, if a bird just only looked for berries in one bush, it would run out of berries and then die. So we yep. need to have that to explore. But anybody who's had more than one child, like I have, had two daughters, I mean, you see how different people are right from the beginning. Yeah. So even if you have the same parents, you're still going to end up a little bit differently. So I think my parents, my father was very curious person. He was born legally blind. He had 2% vision. So he really couldn't do a lot of things that he wanted to do. And it, you know, but he tried to do a lot of different things. So my multitasking thing came from him wanting to do (laughs) a lot of things. Uh, We were taught to just do everything was a game really at the dinner table at night. We would he we had to play this game where we called it school where he'd ask you a lot of questions and so he'd make the question based on your age, so if you were young you got easier questions than if you were older so I got the easiest questions since I was a baby but uh, if you missed the question you would be a third of a hippopotamus and then if you missed all three in a row you'd end up being a hip you know whatever it was so <laughs> I think that that had a lot of impact you know to want to ask questions and explore. I think. Um... You know, I've spent a lot of time with Dan Sullivan. He's my mentor and coach, and I go to a strategic coach. And before the lockdown of travel, you know, every 90 days, I'd fly out to Chicago. And one of the things that has stuck in my mind and has just been reignited from our conversation so far is the art of questions. Mm -hmm. And he talks about you know, answers as being just a moment in time. And it's not the answer that's important. It's the question. 
and getting really good at thinking about your thinking and drilling down to understand how to ask questions. Um, and, and often some of this is timing, right? Uh, and how you frame it because it, it's part of the discovery process, not just the end result that can often bear some very interesting fruits uh, of understanding and things. So I think that's, you know, really uh, an interesting part. Well, you know, you're bringing to mind a lot of the sales training I've had. I mean, in pharmaceutical sales, they put you through years <laughs> of onboarding training of uh, literally two years. The first year going through so much stuff. I, I think they, they teach you a lot of things that are helpful in terms of painting pictures uh, in okay. people's minds for sales. And I think that that if you can ask a good question, you, you're, you know you don't want to ask a close-ended question. Is it a yes or no, right? You want to be able to have people have that sense that they can elaborate and uh, develop their responses. And I think you learn that when you go through sales training. In terms of the situation that we've now found ourselves facing, you know, we're uh, for record, it's the mid mid April. We're right in COVID nineteen that has changed the way the entire planet and workforce is operating, and that speed of change. What we might have felt comfort in before in how to ask questions, what are the right questions, you know, what processes we have. When all of that changes. Um, how we adapt to that new environment, a big part of that is to still remain curious when maybe uh, things are, on one sense, limited. How would you um, either encourage people to be curious when maybe they feel limited uh, because of external circumstances? How would you describe opportunities there? Well, I think we have a lot of opportunity. First of all, we have a lot of time on our hands that a lot of us didn't have in the past. And it there's a chance to really explore the things we never considered exploring. I, I think what I was trying to do with the curiosity uh, research I did was to get people to recognize that they weren't doing enough to explore, to, to get out of status quo thinking. That's kind of how I look at curiosity in the workplace, that we, we fall into this status quo way of doing things and nobody's ever asking, why are we doing this? Why aren't we doing this? Well, you know, how can things be different? And, and when we're home and we've got all this time, I, I think it's really important to kind of focus on the things that have held us back. And that was what my research was all about. Because when I started writing this book, I thought, well, it's really interesting to write about curiosity. I'm interviewing all these interesting people and we've, we've named a lot of them, right? Yeah. And, and I started to think, well, as I wrote the book, uh, I was really surprised by the fact that there wasn't a way to determine what was holding people back from being curious. So there was all these assessments out there that would give you your level. Like, you're, you know, you're high, you're low, you're in the middle. Of what, okay, so I'm low, then what do I do? You know, yeah. And that didn't help me. And so I looked and I thought, well, I have to create this because I have to know why they're not curious so that I can tell them how to get curious. Yep. So uh, I think that when we are home and we have this time, we can focus on why we're not curious, how we can get curious when we go back to work, some of the things we can do. This is a good time to create a plan, to create uh, some outline of the things that are holding us back. And in my research, as you know, there are four things that I found that hold people back. And those four things are fear, assumptions, the voice in your head, basically, yep. technology over and under utilization of it, and environment. And that's basically everybody you've ever known in your life. And if you um, write down some of these things under each of these areas that hold you back, then you can kind of do a kind of a personal SWOT analysis and think of uh, ways to overcome these, these uh, weaknesses, these threats, these issues, and put it into SMART goals, measurable goals. And so when we're able to get back to normal, you know, that's what we can do in our work setting. But right now you could do that in your personal life read a different uh, part of the paper than you normally would read, drive a different way to the store if you can still go to the store or whatever it is and look at things differently. But I, what I really think it helps 
in my research, what I think that was really helpful to me and what I was hoping to help people do was to recognize that you're telling yourself these things or that you're afraid of these things or this person had made you think that you could or couldn't do something or that this was the cool thing or not the good thing to do or whatever it was. And I think as you start to recognize these things, you go, oh, I never even realized that was holding me back. And now you can make a plan to go forward. I, I find it, you know, really fascinating, the whole expansion of understanding who we are, how we show up and how we evolve to show up differently, um, whether that's our own intent uh, to grow or a necessity of survival. And I think the challenge of when we're young, everything's new, everything's first. And so we build, in my mind, this muscle of curiosity because we have no choice. There's nothing there other than being curious. And I guess what I'd like to know from you is that over time, our uh, sort of excitement about firsts, does that shift? And is, is curiosity addictive? You know, if you really work on that muscle and you get sort of some of the rewards and hits of what being curious offers you in terms of stimulus, either chemically or reward in our social or, um, you know, careers. Have you found that those that start on that journey do some of those actions, look at some of those interventions. It's, it's almost like a flywheel that they get momentum and they start, you know, just moving and moving and becoming ultimate, you know, curiosity machines, or is that not the case? I'm just fascinated by, you know, some of these thoughts that are spinning around for me. Well, I, you know, you bring up a lot of very good points of ha what um, happens in our childhood, what changes, what, you know, of course, we get dopamine uh, rush mm -hmm. from being curious. So it can be addictive. You know, we do like that sense that feel good chemical. Uh, I think that there's some really interesting research on what happens to curiosity around like uh, certain time frames in your life. For example, it, it's tied in very much to what we see with creativity. And anybody who's seen this, Sir Ken Robinson TED Talk or uh, George Land's TED Talk, both of them are looking more at creativity, but it, the, the timelines of what they saw of how we start off this really high level and then we hit about age five and then we decline drastically in our curiosity and our creativity. And uh, Ken Robinson was saying, you know, he thinks that we educate people out of it uh, yeah. because, you know, the school system was set up more, yep. you know, it would, would reward math and science or different things. And the creativity was not so rewarded for a while because of the industrial age. And he has a really interesting talk. If you haven't seen it, it's one of the best actually ever. And that gets some of the most hits for that reason. And George Land did a lot of research at NASA and he did, uh, took a look at, how we are at, at like age five, 98% were creative geniuses. And by the time you're 31, so 2% or it, I think those are the numbers, but it's something dr really dramatic. Really dramatic. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that a lot of those are environmental impacts and, you know, a lot of it can be because, you know, you go to school, you have teachers who have to teach to the test. They can't, really be there to answer every single question if you're interested in this but everybody else is going this way you get kind of left behind to some extent so it, it's there's a lot of factors that'll impact it but you know i've met steve wozniak i don't know if you've read his book i was but he talks yeah. about his experience growing up um in the book yeah, he said his father, who I think was literally a rocket scientist, I, I mean, he came up with, the, with all these um, gadgets and wires and, you know, everything from work. And he'd give them to young was and say, you know, you got to attach this to this because that'll bring the electricity, which will bring this and will cause this. And he gave him the real background, the foundation, yep. the why things. The first principles. Right. And that really ignited his sense of curiosity. But you know, there's gonna be the, the opposite uh, people. Uh, uh, Elon Musk's dad said, oh, you'll never make it, you'll never, you know, and he moved away to get away from him uh, and then showed him otherwise. So some of it, we have this personality within us that might go one way or the other. Yep. But for me, the importance is the recognition of what you have and what maybe has been held back within you 
So in terms of having curiosity or not, what different levels we have and then working on it, what are some of the outcomes in terms of, you know, from uh, a deeper uh, opportunities for experimentation or innovation or invention, things like that. I wonder if you could um, maybe share some real life stories of maybe companies that you're working with at the moment and how they're leveraging curiosity and in what areas, in what ways and what kind of, you know, value and goals are they achieving with that? Just share perhaps some, some real life stories that our uh, audience can engage with. Well, um, I'm working with a few companies, you know, I want to kind of give foundation to that to begin with, because I think what these companies that I work with uh, are trying to do is get away from status quo thinking, get people more in right. innovative, more engaged, more productive. So and that's their driver, as it were. Right. Like, There's, my I mean, job to be done is I want to be more innovative. <laughs> I want to, you know. Right. It's all yeah. bottom line of okay. being more successful, more productive, right? Great. Okay, think of it like baking a cake, okay? So you're gonna bake a cake and you know your outcome is a cake and you're mixing together eggs and flour and oil or whatever it is, you mix these ingredients, you put it in a pan, you put it in the oven, what happens? Well, you're hoping for cake, but if you didn't turn on the oven, you don't. You get goo, right? And yep. so. In the workplace, if you're instead of cake, your end, pro, end result you want is productivity and, and uh, money, you're mixing together ingredients of creativity, innovation, engagement, yep. but nobody's turning on the oven, the spark, which is curiosity. So if you don't do that, you get goo, right? So okay. and that, that's the whole point of that story. And if you look at this, this is all about status quo thinking. And I often talk about uh, a, an experiment. You've probably seen this um, National Geographic experiment where a woman went into a doctor's office thinking she's getting her eyes examined. But it was really a social experiment to see if people go along with status quo thinking. And so when she got in there, all of it, every minute or two, they'd ring this bell. And everybody around her were actors. She doesn't know this, right? And they all stand up and sit down with no explanation every time the bell rang. And they just wanted to see if she'd go along with this status quo thinking. So after just three times of the bell ringing, she gets up and sits down with them. And so they thought, well, this is interesting. They kept standing up and sitting down. They thought, well, let's take everybody out of the room. And they did. And one at a time as if they're getting their eyes examined. And they rang the bell to see what she'd do by herself. And she stood up and sat down with no reasoning, just that everybody else had done it, right? So they thought, well, let's add some real patients to the room and see what they do. So they added new people to the room who weren't actors. And when she stood up and sat down, the guy next to her looked at her. He goes, why did you do that? And she said, well, everybody else was doing it. I thought I was supposed to. So the next time the bell rings, she gets up and sits down and he does it with her. And so does everybody else as they start adding people. And nobody knows why they're doing it. Yep. They just have gotten this, this is called social learning, right? Yep. So that's what companies are doing. People are standing up and sitting down when the bell rings. They don't know why. Nobody knows why they're doing things anymore because it's just, that's the way we've always done that. And that's what everybody else is doing. And so a few companies I work with realize this. Uh, I, I mean, I work with you know, Verizon, for example, just flew me back to New York before all of this. And we did some videos for their, um, their CEO really embraces the need for a curious culture. And he's trying to, to emphasize this. So we created these videos that uh, are micro videos, because that's what people like to learn in, in these different formats to I shared some information about curiosity and then they'd bring in somebody from the company and they'd give their story of how they overcame and became more curious. And, and they would burst these out to people within the company. It was just a really great experience. Um, I was supposed to go to New York this last week to do another series for Wiley. This group uh, was creating videos for different, different companies to, to learn micro kind of things about curiosity as well. Uh, I'm working on um, a research with Novartis. One of the people who works at Novartis is writing her doctoral dissertation. She's using my curiosity code index assessment 
to determine, you know, uh, levels of curiosity and things that are going from uh, based on prior to taking the CCI and after taking the CCI, if people are more curious, and they're using that as foundation for the overall um, improvement of curiosity within what they're doing there. And their CMO is, is very much interested in developing curiosity. Uh, they have 100 hours a year of uh, what they hope people will learn to develop their sense of a curiosity and they get rewarded for that. So they offer all this free education, all these you know, free videos, whatever, there's all kinds of stuff and they all share their results. They have big boards that they all write on what I'm curious about today and they all share this and celebrate it. So those are just some examples of some of the companies I work with and what they're doing. What are some of the challenges because I'm sure we've both seen examples where within corporates, they have an objective, they get excited about it, they do it for a little while, and then exactly the same way as you described of they keep doing the same thing they've always done, and it becomes a learned social learning, learned behavior, you know, the similar ones with monkeys going up and being sprayed, and uh, there's lots of examples of how you might not even have been at the root of how things were being done, but a second or third generation is just following the same bit. What are some of the challenges that, how does it stick? You know, any kind of new initiative, oh, I'm a champion of curiosity, I do a load of that. Mm -hmm. Have you um, seen yet the, ah, oh, it comes back, the corporate immune system comes in and starts to, you know, consume these, you know, new innovations and initiatives and it just morphs back to normal. What are well, some of the, have you seen it? And if you have, ha, how have you overcome those kind of challenges to maintain it maybe long after the first, ooh, let's do this? <laughs> well, the Curiosity Code Index just came out in 2019. So we haven't had a point where this is starting to slide back because it's so new. So I can't say that they, they have done that with my work, but I can say that that does happen in, in general in cor corporations. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it with, they'll give a disc or an emotional intelligence test and they go, oh, that was fun. And then nobody does anything with it, right? They just yeah. kind of have the, the training and then it has to be incorporated. Just, it's kind of like engagement surveys where you, you get, a, these are the issues we're gonna work on. We're gonna incorporate it into our, our um, training programs and we're gonna have goals and we're gonna make sure it's part of the culture. And you have to have leaders, like I interviewed Xander Lurie, who's the leader of uh, SurveyMonkey. I mean, nobody, gets more curious than Survey Monkey. That's what they do for a living, right? Yeah. So they do, you know, skip level meetings where they have people ask questions of people that maybe aren't their direct reports. And they have uh, all these questions that they set up as this is just how we embrace our culture. And it's spelled out very specifically. It's not, and, and they, uh, em they have uh, these behaviors that they want others to emulate. So that they, that's a very hard thing for some leaders sometimes because they don't want to look like they don't know it all, right? And so they have to admit they don't know the answers to a lot of questions and they have to get past their own fear, their own assumptions, their own environment, their own technology issues, their own issues. So they have to say when, you know, this is part of our culture, I'm going to start it off. I'm going to ask a question that I normally would be not you know, hesitant to ask because it might look like I don't know everything, but I don't know everything. And you, you start it off so that others can emulate your behavior. And if you can make that as part of always questioning, always saying, rewarding people who get out of status quo thinking, then yep. you're not going to fall back on it's just a one day thing. And I guess it's like many things, you know, the subtleties of invoking behavior change from it being oh this is an initiative or a program to being this is the way Our we want to do things uh -huh. um you know and looking at building strength from vulnerability you know the fear and being able to be vulnerable to be curious to find out something that you didn't know uh is actually brave and right, leaders right. being able to reach that sense um of the environmental factors to uh, allow themselves to behave in that way, hopefully will stimulate lots of those things. Well, I, wonder... I know, uh, I, I just wanted to add yeah. that, you know, I train not only the HR people, if they want to give the, the Curiosity Code Index, but I train consultants as well. And when I train these people to become certified to give this, when we do these certification trainings, we teach them how, as if I was giving it, you know, that they know 
that we don't just go through employees' results and say, here's your results and is, have a nice day. <laughs> we, yep. we go through all their results and then we create an action plan for them for all of the items that they have issues with, you know, and we, you know, this is how we're going to make it measurable. Here's our goals. And we're going to incorporate this in our updates with leaders and, and how they're going to go and develop that personally. But then we go beyond that. We go to the corporate level and think of Disney, for example, when Disney had a problem with uh, a lot of turnover in the past in their laundry division. And as glamorous as it sounds to work in a laundry division, even at Disney, it's not great, right? So they were losing all these people and they thought, well, how can we keep these people? And uh, they thought, well, let's go to them and ask them, what can we do to make your job better? Well, they thought they were going to get stuff they can't do, you know, it's expensive things that are impossible. But instead, they actually got things that were doable, like put a vent over my desk where I work and make my table where I work, go up and down so my back doesn't hurt, things that they could fix. They're going, yeah, we can do that, right? Yep. So those are things you can do. And so I, in the training that I do, it's the same kind of thing. We go to the horse's mouth, so to speak. You go to these people in the training sessions and you go, okay, so your employees here and they company struggling with innovation, they're struggling with engagement, they're struggling with conflict and, and teamwork or whatever the top issues are that you've received from leadership and what you know are company issues. You ask employees, how can they help you develop curiosity so you can improve these things? You get all this feedback, the trainer, if it's me or the HR person or the consultant or whoever's doing this training, puts together this big report saying, this is what everybody's giving you. You're, it's not singling out anybody. Yep. Everybody's got their private you know, information. Nobody has to share their levels and, and that stuff. And yet leaders get this huge report. So basically the employees are doing all the work. The, the trainer and the leader just gets it all and says, here, here's your solution. Kind of like with Disney, here's your solution. Take the things that we can do and fix them. I guess what's interesting is, you know, we, we see as far as we can see in terms of that level of curiosity. So they're, the way they might imagine solutions or imagine what the problem is. Um, I like the, uh, the, the piece of the five whys, you know, one of the best questions in the world, right? Why? <laughs> and, you know, oh, my back hurts, why? And you might then get down to the fact that the, the desk, you know, uh -huh. and, uh -huh one great laundry person and staff might be able to connect those things. Uh, what would you like to do? Oh, well, for them, it might be make my shifts shorter as opposed to make my desk higher. And I guess curiosity <laughs> is um, involved in two parts of it, is that it's involved in both what you're trying to solve uh, and why you're trying to solve it together with then the how uh, yeah. of those things. Uh -huh. And Another part that I think is quite interesting with the work that we do that might supplement some of these things is around uh, resilience and unlearning. So, you know, we're curious, but if our curious uh, kind of orbit and expansion of that is limited because we've only got, you know, eyes that might see 2% into the distance, uh -huh. uh, if we have an ability to take us out of a the past or out of what has been successful before, maybe our opportunity to be even more curious uh, could be an interesting uh, angle and dynamic to these things. And it's why often we see throughout history, a lot of innovations coming from places of naivety, you know, yeah. you know not yeah. having experts in the room and having well, that ties into Marshall Goldsmith's what, you know, what got you here won't get it. you their mentality. And also Naveen Jane's what we went back to that you're learning from scratch. You don't have these bad habits. It's like golf. If you've always shot a certain way and then now you try to start over again, it's a lot harder than if you take your lessons right before you make all these bad uh, ways of hitting the golf ball. But all of us have a certain foundation that yep. we sometimes have to be able to unlearn and relearn. And we have to recognize that if you don't follow these changes and ask questions and explore, you're going to end up Blockbuster, you're going to end up Kodak, you're going to end up all these companies that uh, have so many 
um, issues. You know, I really like that Ben and Jerry is what they do. They have a, what, on their website, they, they actually create a, a funeral for past flavors that were successful and they're no longer successful. And then they just kind of say, yeah, this was great for its time. They were, they're happy. They, they say, this is great. We loved it from 1987 to 1992 or whatever the numbers are. This was a wonderful thing and it's still out there and we'll honor it, but it's, people don't want this anymore and we've moved on. And I think some of these ideas we have, Sometimes we need to put a little funeral together yep. <laughs> for and be able to say, let go. I think Google has a, a site uh, killed by Google and it's a <laughs> celebration of all of their projects that they've yeah. killed. Yeah. And that's Nothing how lasts forever. Yeah. And that's how Astro Teller, uh, who runs X, you know, what was previously Moonshots talks about uh, when they're doing new projects and new things, looking for ways to kill it not looking for ways to keep it alive. So what are the things, the two biggest things we would do to learn whether this should be killed or not? Um, and it's an That's interesting process when you're looking at um, things that are so on the edge and so on the fringe um, of maybe there isn't enough evidence yet uh, of something. It's unpredictable. So we have to be open-minded um, but not looking to keep it alive, looking to kill it. And that's just an interesting uh, kind of thought I, process. I, know. I, I find it really fascinating. The companies who are able to get past and think beyond, you know, sometimes you just have to have like these uh, sessions of like, what, what could be better? What, what, you know, I, it, Monopoly, uh, they kept coming out with, you know, Star Wars editions, dogs editions and different things. And they finally thought, well, can we come out with something that's different, you know? And they, they researched and they found out that there's a certain, like a really high percentage, I think it was 40, 60%, I can't remember, or people cheat when they play Monopoly. So they came out with Monopoly's cheaters edition. <laughs> oh, that's, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. So there's, there can be just tweaks that, make it unique enough you know what i mean and it, it's it's looking beyond it's asking those kind of questions it's it's sometimes getting outside perspectives that's why consultants are so popular because you you sometimes don't know what you don't know yeah give a new perspective um right, right. on things in in terms of you know our last sort of five ten minutes or so to look at um your work and the lens of people facing what you're talking about here is they're going through some form of change and they're adapting. You know, they're adapting from a sense of uh, a process or um, innovation to looking at it in a new way and now adopting these kind of behaviors of curiosity so that they understand, you know, their assumptions, the fears, the environmental, the different factors that might inhibit them from achieving their end result. Mm -hmm. In terms of... Um, you know, you've created this and it's, you know, been created from a sense of uh, identifying a problem, not just because, oh, I found some nice technology, let's create something and then go and find the problem. Uh, right. You've come at it from, from the best way, right? You've um, researched, you've written a book, you've started to build out this uh, methodology and assessment to begin to help people uncover those insights and more importantly then build action plans around it what would you like to see in you know the the coming years of how curiosity code and curiosity uh, starts to get embedded within organizations and businesses what's part of your vision for the future of that I really would like to see more research done. And you and I talked a little bit about this yesterday on my show about research with your work. And when you have a new idea, a new assessment, anything like that, it takes years of data to really go, hey, look, this is what we've been saying all along. And no one could get you that on day one. So you have, I mean, I've done lots of years of uh, exploration to create the assessment and the factor analysis and to make sure it was valid. And, and then I peer reviewed, published and all the things that you do to get the assessment. But you would like to get, like I was talking about what I'm working with, with Novartis, you know, more of those kind of research studies, you know, you yeah. take a, uh, maybe Cashton's before and after, take his research and measure levels of curiosity. So you're low now and now you're high after yep. taking 
CCI kind of thing. I think those are really important kind of studies that we need. And I'd like to see more people do research about the value of curiosity to engagement, to innovation, to, to yep. motivation, to drive. Because no matter who I've had on my show, from Francesca Gino to, you know, all the Harvard professionals and, you know, Amy Edmondson, you name whoever's been on my show who are these genius minds. If they're an expert in curiosity, or I mean, I'm sorry, in creativity or in uh, motivation or any of those things, and you ask them what comes first, they all say curiosity. Curiosity. So we need to, to prove that in research. We need to prove all these things that we kind of know it makes sense, but we really need more research. More research. And it's interesting, you know, we're in quite a similar uh, stage of what we're doing, you and I, and right. those uh -huh. other things that you talk about, uh, they're your, you know, um, knowing which door to go in, they're your tickets to the playing field to allow you to go on the playing field, right? All of the work that you do in the background with the data scientists and with all of those things. But then it's a different game. You get on the field and the rules and what um, persuades people, you know, what uh, evidence right. they're looking for, all of those things is slightly different. And I, I think what is exciting for me is we don't have to follow the paths of the others. Every right. other assessment that has been in the past that has followed a model for how they've then done it, how they've got the volume, how they've got to the first, you know, million data points of people who've taken it took a long bloom in time. <laughs> I'm interested that we're living in an exponential world mm -hmm. with these amazing technologies that can, you know, hit some moonshots and say, how might we get a hundred thousand in six months? How might we get to, you know, in the millions in, in a, just a few short years? Right. And we're going to have to think differently. And by that sense, we're going to be, need to be curious as a company of how might we achieve it? What are some of the obstacles and barriers? How would we do it through collaborations? Who might be able to come to that, that party? So if somebody has been listening to this, that's really, it's perked their curiosity about curiosity, um, how could they show up to you to help you achieve that vision? Which would be the perfect people that would come in and say, Diane, what you said is great. I'm showing up because you're exactly who I asked for. So who, who are those kinds of people? Uh, what do they look like and how would they show up for you? Well, you know, I work with all different levels of people. I mean, either people that are taking the assessment uh, from an individual standpoint who want to develop their level of curiosity, they go on the site, they take the assessment, they find out immediately. Just, it's like taking Myers-Briggs or DISC or whatever they've taken in the past in terms of fast, you know, they get their results. Um, in terms of uh, in, uh, companies and corporations, I, I, I work with, uh, you know, I spoke at SHRM and I've talked to all these different uh, CHRO groups and, and different, you know, societies and different things where I'm working with getting the message out to the decision makers of who incorporates that, those kind of cultural changes within the, the, each organization. So I, I want to get them trained. I want to get their HR people trained so that they can give it to the entire organization. Because this, if you've taken a DISC or an emotional intelligence test in your organization, this is something you should be taking as well. Because as important as emotional intelligence is, I believe curiosity ties into so many aspects of emotional intelligence. Because to truly be empathetic, which is a big factor in emotional intelligence, you have to ask questions. Otherwise you have yeah. no idea how to empathize with that person. So these are really critical skills. So it, it, it goes to the HR level. It goes to the top leaders who are listening to this, who need to recognize the importance of curiosity for their organization as a whole. So, I mean, I am contacted every day from different levels by different people for different reasons, but the, the excitement, consultants find this hugely exciting because they are so tired of putting people into boxes only, or, or uh, they've given the disc and they think it's great, but maybe the company didn't follow through, or, you know, they, they, you only, you know, how many times do you need to know you're a DI, you know, <laughs> or whatever it is, right? So this is something that ignites a complete cultural change. And that's what companies are going to need. We know the majority of companies that were in existence, you know, 20 years ago, aren't even here. 
And so, and imagine what it's going to be like now after this crisis. We need to have people who are using their curiosity to develop vaccines, to develop this way of handling crisis or whatever it is. And if we can get people more innovative by asking more questions, we'll just get there faster. 100%. And I couldn't agree more that, you know, we, we are facing a time when we need innovators, we need innovative minds and companies um, that are curious that can react quickly, uh, you know, adapt fast to make sure they don't collapse um, and that they become not only survive, but grow and thrive uh, in the future. And it's a, it's a continual piece. So this isn't a, a once and done. This is how it embeds in an organization to get long-term sustainability. And I, I'd like to just share uh, two final thoughts with you. Um, a bit. One was you mentioned Monopoly and mm-hmm. Um, I remembered a presentation I was on a a few weeks ago that was talking about when Monopoly was invented and it was invented. I'm not sure if you know the story. Uh, So it was in 1929. So it was right in the stock market crash. Uh, So uh the the designer, he was, you know, in a sales job and he Uh got fired and he Uh became the world's first million dollar game designer. So right in the mix of a crisis of 1929, got fired, was curious and became the world's first million dollar game designer. It's really interesting, you know, in the same you know, vein of lots of these pressure points, one that we're in right now is the mother of invention. And so having this happen for us, added into that cake mix, some curiosity, yeah. some of these other bits, uh-huh. And we'll create some really, truly wonderful things for humanity, I think, in the future. And, and that truly excites me uh, yeah. that we have people like you working to uh, help humanity create brighter and better futures, which is lovely um, to be involved in. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate your work uh, in, in those pieces. So, um, yeah, if, uh, as I say, uh, the you described the type of people, what they would look, how do they get in touch? What does that look like? What's the best way you say people reach out to you all the time? How will they cut through the noise to say, Diane, I need the help. And this is why, what's the best route to actually contact you? Well, you know, you can always reach me through my website, which is drdianehamilton.com. You can get to the curiosity information there. You can also go to directly to curiositycode.com to take the assessments and uh, take training and do all that type of thing. But you can also get there through drdianehamilton.com. And I'm on all social media at drdianehamilton. So that's D-R-D-I-A-N-E-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N and no spaces. And uh, I, you know, connect with people on LinkedIn and social media, I'm on you know, all the different Twitter, everything else, and happy to chat. Anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Love it. And Curiosity Code was your book. And your next one that's coming out, the title of that? Well, it's still in process. It's about perception. So it's, perception. Prob- it's power of perception. Maybe uh, we're working on the final uh, draft right now. And uh, we, because of the COVID thing, we, we've decided to wait towards maybe the end of this, this year more to, to release okay. it. But we're going to have... The Perception Power Index will go along with that. And uh, per, that'll be exciting because that'll kind of combine IQ, EQ, CQ for curiosity and CQ for culture kind of all together. So it'll be get, really- and maybe AQ. And maybe, and maybe AQ. Could be. <laughs> there we go. Well, it's been a real pleasure to have the conversation and I look forward to actually our relationship blossoming because I think we're trying to be a hero to the same person. Uh, and the same people in the world. And we're all about collaboration. So I look forward to uh, being curious together and seeing what we can create. So thank you. I look forward to it as well. Thank you for this show. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed going to both sides of this uh, personality and assessment uh, discussion because yesterday was great and I really enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.